Washington. We hear a little about his education, but he's one of the most brilliant, one of the wisest leaders in America. And he's completely home educated and self taught. One of the best books you'll ever read of George Washington is back when he was a single digit kid. And he did Washington's Rules of Civility. And deals with manners and attitude and kindness and deference to other people, which is still a cool book for use today. He was a visitor to the Caribbean, which, we, which people probably don't know about George Washington. He went to Barbados to try to find a cure for tuberculosis with his half-brother, Lawrence. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful in their quest to find a cure for Lawrence's tuberculosis, and, the, and he died shortly thereafter. Well, Washington inherits dozens of slaves when he's 11 years old. But as he starts moving toward fighting for freedom, he starts thinking about freedom. And I don't like being a slave by the British, and you know, I've got my slaves don't like being, and, and suddenly things start coming together. It's the first time he's really ever considered it. What Washington did was he started treating his slaves like family. He would never break up a family. He would not separate a man from a woman. He wouldn't even buy slaves. The ones that had been given to him, he kept. Uh, he freed them on his death. He took care of them. He actually was a very poor guy because of having to take care of so many other people, but he felt a responsibility for these folks. Um, but Washington was anti-slavery. As a matter of fact, as President of the United States, he signed the first ever federal anti-slavery law. It's because of George Washington's signature that we didn't have slavery in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and Iowa and, and across what was called the northwest part of the United States. Washington just, he, he did not like slavery. He was a big whiskey producer. He had a still at Mount Vernon that was one of the biggest producers of whiskey in all the surrounding states, and one year produced 11,000 gallons of whiskey. 1755, he was in a battle with the Indians, and he wrote that four bullets went through his coat, and two horses were shot out from under them, but he survived unscathed which he attributed to the power of prophets. In his farewell address, which is best known for its warning against entangling alliances, George Washington actually said that religion and morality were um, fundamental to political prosperity. So he actually was a public advocate of the importance of religion in politics. People think of him as a deist, one of these believers in a remote watchmaker god. But he actually thought that organized religion was quite important. George Whitfield's part of the First Great Awakening. And it was the First Great Awakening that really led up to American independence. And founders said, without the Great Awakening, you don't have American independence. So that was an important revival. It was kind of a child prodigy. He started giving sermons to mass audiences in England when he was as young as eight. And he finally came over to America at age 22 in 1740, just when Samuel Adams had graduated from Harvard. And he preached to crowds of tens of thousands in Boston. It was kind of like the rock concert at the time. He averaged preaching about a thousand times a year off horseback. That's unbelievable. So here's a guy that in, in 34 years preached 32,000 sermons, and 80% of all Americans physically heard George Whitfield preach a sermon, which is unbelievable. Samuel Adams father-in-law was the minister of a church in Boston, the New South Church, and that church was so packed by people wanting to hear George Whitfield preach that there was a panic and people thought that the balcony was collapsing. And in the rush to get out, five people actually died. Then Franklin became a really close friend of Whitfield, as did a lot of the founding fathers. Franklin one day was listening to Whitfield preach, and there's a massive crowd of, of tens of thousands, and literally about 30,000 in the crowd. And with Franklin being the scientist he was, he thought, I wonder how many could actually physically hear Whitfield speak. So he started backing up through the crowd and got further and further and further back and got out to the outer limit of where he could still hear Whitfield speak. And he calculated the, the distance there, the radius, and he drew a radius and said, how many people? And he figured that 100,000 people could physically hear Whitfield preach a sermon without any kind of amplification. Whitfield had a huge impact in 
and really calling America to be a separate nation. While he was preaching the Great Awakening, he's one of the very first voices to call for a separation from Great Britain. It's interesting that the two people who went from America to Great Britain to protest against the Step Act tax were Ben Franklin and George Whitfield. <laughs> In 1770, he died. He's buried at a church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. In 1775, when the first troops were being sent from Massachusetts out into battle, they all gathered at that church at Newburyport around the sepulcher of George Whitfield to have their, their charge, have the sermon. And what they did was they then lifted the top off that sepulcher. Each of the soldiers reached in and cut a little piece off of Whitfield's robe. He was their inspiration for, for independence and going to fight. You know, we don't hear about Sam Adams much anymore at all, and we used to. It used to be that great historians like John Fisk said that the top two people in the American Revolution were George Washington and Sam Adams. You don't have America without them. And they've just kind of fallen off the scope of, of, of history now, and it's really unfortunate. Sam Adams, we don't really put at the top because he breaks the stereotypes of what all the revisions have made America to be. Under this philosophy of deconstruction, we've got to make America look really bad, and so we've got to make all the founders look like racists, and we've got to make them all look like bigots, and all look like atheists, and all look immoral, and Sam Adams doesn't fit any of that. You know, Sam Adams was way ahead of everybody else. I mean, he was back in college at Harvard, and his thesis was whether it was lawful to resist government, whether it was lawful to resist the king. Nobody talked about that at that point in time. And man, that, that was treasonable back at the time he wrote that paper in college. But Adams gave that speech in front of the same governor that 30 years later he had to take on in the American Revolution. <laughs> He was a tax collector, which is kind of surprising given that he started one of the greatest tax rebellions in the history of the world. He actually got sued by the town of Boston for not collecting the taxes that he was supposed to have collected. There's no suggestion that he took any of the money himself. It's just that people don't like to pay taxes. And I think that was an insight that was part of the core of Samuel Adams' rebellion eventually against the British. <laughs> He was so poor that when he got elected to the Continental Congress the first time, his neighbors got together and took a collection so he could own his first suit of clothes. They didn't want him to go to Congress looking as poor as he did. He had a dog, a Newfoundland dog called Q, and its reputation was that it had as intense a dislike of British soldiers as Samuel Adams did. Today, you hear Sam Adams, and it's the brewery, and that's it. There's no question that Sam Adams had a malt house in his day, but in the sense of a brewery, no way. And there's a real difference. A malt house in those days, they produced malt, they produced beer and wine. And interestingly enough, you couldn't get drunk off those things. He ran a malt house, but the fun thing about it was he was lousy at it. He was lousy at every business he ever ran, except the business of the country. <laughs>